This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, welcome, everybody, today. It's a real pleasure to be back here. I haven't been back to Cornell in a few years, even though New York City is not really that far away. So thank you so much for inviting me here to talk about the Sustainable Sites Initiative, which is a project that I've been involved with now for almost eight years. And it's a project that I got started with my involvement with through Cornell, through working with uh, Dr. Nina Basic and the Sustainable Sites team to develop sustainable uh, protocols for landscapes. And so today I'm going to discuss um, what the guidelines are all about and go through some of the principles behind the guidelines. I'm going to discuss the process through which we've come through in about the last 10 years total to get to where we are today with the guideline and rating system. Then I'm going to give some examples of credits that probably relate to some of the work you may be doing uh, relating to vegetation and soil specifically, even though the system is, uh, involves much more than just that. But I'll focus a little bit on that today. And then I'll also give some site-specific uh, examples of projects that were involved in the pilot or testing process for the system um, within the last few years. And then also I'll go into what's next, since there's more to come from this project. So as I mentioned, I first got involved with this project as a, um, as a graduate student, and I was lucky enough to get hired on to be a research assistant, specifically in the vegetation subcommittees, um, and with a little bit of work also in the human health and well-being, and even the soil subcommittees. Um, also, Fred Cowett, and I don't know if Fred's here today, did a lot of work on this project over the years in the soils uh, sections. And I believe he was also a reviewer in many of the pilot studies uh, for this project. So anybody who has more questions about sustainable sites after I've gone, um, and especially about soil, I would recommend you talk to Fred, and then also Nina Basic as well, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because she's at an Oak conference. So, um, so sustainable sites is essentially a set of guidelines and a voluntary rating system for sustainable landscape design, construction, and maintenance. And this came out of the growth of green building, which over the past decade and a half has had tremendous impact on the construction, uh, design, and then facilities maintenance uh, professions overall, uh, not just throughout America, but globally. And so this is the very first LEED Platinum building in, in America. And so it was uh, really forward thinking at the time. But one of the troubling things was that when you looked at landscapes in early versions of LEED, there was a paltry amount of um, direction and really not a lot of great critical thinking involving what sustainable landscapes really meant in relation to the building side of things. And so, you know, even though we know that buildings are really important and how we direct our resources in and how we construct them and manage them is really important. Uh, there's a lot more than just that in the world. <laughs> there's a lot more than just buildings, thank goodness. So uh, the, the team on sites came together, um, and essentially the team that first came together to discuss some of the other issues with sustainable development, um, which include you know, pesticide use, um, you know, water usage, um, invasive species problems, uh, combined sewer overflow issues and how we manage our stormwater, uh, urban heat island effects, climate change, uh, erosion problems. These were all issues that we didn't think were being very well managed through the LEED or the U.S. Green Building Council uh, sustainability criteria. So with that, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center through University of Texas at Austin, the U.S. Green Building Council, and the American Society of Landscape Architects all came together and sort of all simultaneously had the same idea that they really needed to, to develop a rating system that partnered with LEED, or U.S. Green Building Council guidelines, and helped to uh, get those a little more on track with uh, the best scientific knowledge that they could put together and the best team that they could put together to try to um, move forward with a comprehensive uh, set of ratings and um, a system to help put uh, a better spin on what sustainable design meant in terms of landscapes. So with that, the goals of sites have been and continue to be to create regenerative systems and to foster resiliency, to ensure future resource supply and to mitigate climate change, 
to enhance human well-being and strengthen community. So there's community components to this as well. To also transform the market through design, development, and maintenance practices. And so I'm involved a lot in capital projects in my current role. And I've seen over the past several years how uh, sustainable development guidelines such as, as LEED have really transformed the industry. And so what was once really difficult to conceive of um, has over time, through the work of these types of rating systems, driven it to become more of an industry standard. So while the green uh, building side of things is really well on its way with LEED and some other sustainability systems like that, the landscape side is still a little bit nascent as far as how we're going to follow up with um, industry standards and to generate that further. So, oh, not going through. Okay. So the principles behind sustainable sites are based on ecosystem services, which are benefits that people obtain from ecosystems that support our lives, but are unfortunately often considered free and are not often a part of traditional accounting methods. So this whole system is underpinned by bringing forward uh, some of these things that we haven't always thought of um, as formally in, as far as cost benefits are concerned. And so these are just a few of the ecosystem services that were actually considered in the development of all the entire mm -hmm. rating system. And um, we're, we're going forward and trying to build systems that are a lot more um, thoughtful. And so this could be the result when you, um, it's just an example of a, of a successful uh, credentialed pilot project that's been certified recently. And so you can see there's quite a difference between that original lead platinum building that I showed where there was like a couple of token trees in the front versus, versus um, a much more sophisticated landscape that uh, takes into account a lot of the other ecosystem services that um, were not heretofore really thought of formally. So some of the other uh, principles behind sites include the fact that we believe that almost any type of landscape could be uh, developed in this manner. So the testing has been very thoughtfully um, positioned so that even if you have a really small site, you should be able to do this. Whether you have a really hyper urban site, you should also be able to take the system and apply the principles. Or if you have a pristine, um, green site that's uh, you know maybe even high quality um, natural areas that you should also be able to apply these principles there too and so um, also with the idea that ecosystem services can be derived with any landscape in theory so the timeline of sites goes way back to 2005 so 10 years now um, and so through time we've gone through uh, research and development uh, developing standards and guidelines um, and then performance benchmarks, were in, which were in draft form in 2008, 2009, which is what I was involved with early on in helping to create and edit some of those. Then they ran a pilot program between 2010 and 2012, and I also was involved with a pilot project in Canada when, in my formal role um, at the Humber Arboretum in Toronto. And so I've got pilot program experience as well, and I can tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, then also beyond that, they've been working with all the data that's come through the pilot project and been refining it since there were obviously lots of criticisms and lots of challenges that we were able to um, look at from the pilot process that were then taken, go, went back through and then tried to clean up the process to make it um, easier, uh, more accessible and um, hopefully less expensive also to, to manage. And so. Now, the latest rendition of sustainable sites is actually in V2, and I have a copy of the guidelines here, so it's quite large, but um, you can get this online if you'd like. And so this is the latest version of the guidelines and rating systems. And um, what's great is just this past June, it's been formally um, announced that the US Green Building Council and GBCI, which is the credentialing and accreditation body for LEED, is formally taking this system on. So it's now officially part of the LEED suite of systems. And this is the first time ever that the US Green Building Council has adopted a program that they didn't uh, specifically develop themselves. So it's quite an achievement. And the, se the system's been, um, I guess, designed to mesh from the very get-go. But it's taken quite a lot of work to get that to come to fruition. And so finally, um, you, can become, uh, you can have a site that's accredited officially um, and will be credentialed through GBCI. 
So with the three reports that have been released uh, to date, this was the first one that um, you can look this up and see how um, everything was based initially. Then um, there's also been some great uh, support through the U.S. government. And so an example of um, the way that this particular system is influencing not just industry standards, but also in, in, um, influencing government policy is that the U.S. government's been adopting the guidelines um, also for their own sites since the government um, owns quite a lot of acreage throughout the country. So it, it can be very influential just to have a government agree that these are their de facto guidelines that they're going to use going forward. So that's actually happening. And so beyond that, um, I'll explain the site's program goals for the pilot program because um, it's, been, it's been very interesting to see a lot of different kinds of sites go through the pilot process and uh, get we were able to derive a lot of great information to refine the process through the pilot programs. So we really were looking to gain feedback and revise the credits from the get-go since we knew that this is quite a complex uh, system. And so we've been um, always knowing that it's not going to be really ever finished for quite some time. Um, so the pilot program started in 2010, mm -hmm. and these are the kinds of projects that, um, project types. Mm -hmm. So there was a good diversity deliberately in the pilot project sele selection process. Uh, between types of spaces, so it ranges between open space and institutional, commercial, residential, uh, government. Project sizes also tried to have a diversity of really small sites and even very large sites. So some of the sites that were in the pilot project were m well over 500 acres, which is quite large. And then also a different mix of existing uses. So um, the way we define uh, Oh, yeah, okay, so the way we define, sorry, I'm going to go back here, Grayfield, Greenfield, and Brownfield. Grayfield is a previously developed site, but not one that is completely toxic. Uh, Greenfield is something that's not really been um, that affected by development, so um, a natural area might be considered a greenfield, but a park, depending on the original usage, could be as well. And then there's brownfields, which are seriously toxic sites, which actually need some sort of remediation um, even extra thought and process to be able to make use of them and to get them to be um, regenerative again. So uh, there's 47 sites to date that were certified by the pilot projects and the pilot project process is now closed. And so um, there were originally, I think, uh, maybe close to 200 sites that applied to be pilot projects. And so these were the sites that um, across the country actually finished the process and actually got certification. So. I mentioned that I was involved with a pilot project in Canada, and we did not achieve certification. And so it is as much telling what sites did not achieve certification as it is which ones did. And so um, though I was sad that we didn't achieve certification, um, one of the challenges that we had, um, and one th thing that I deliberately went into with my eyes wide open, is that I was trying to certify a site that had been completed uh, primarily over five years before. So the message that I got and that went back to the site's team was that you should not really try to be uh, getting certified for this particular sustainable sites uh, certification process unless you've got a very new project coming online and you're able to start the process for sustainable sites in early in the concept stage. So I was trying to do it on the back end and I really couldn't get all the data together um, in order to do that from what the site looked like prior to the project. So. Um, those were words of caution that I had to bring back to the sites team and they took that and I think now they know that now. So um, that's just one example of how you, know, you might fail if you're doing a pilot project and that's okay too. We went pretty far down the process. So, um, so as I mentioned, we got 47 sites certified and a very good mix of different project types and that was absolutely deliberate um, and so got great data from that. Um, but what was really um, an early stage criticism of the Sustainable Sites Initiative was whether or not you could do it for a really, really small site. And we did have some, some sites that were able to prove that, yes, you can do this. And for instance, you could actually apply these principles to a backyard landscape, like an urban postage stamp landscape, and still do that um, if you'd like. But it is a little bit easier, perhaps, if you have a larger scale to work with. Mm -hmm. It is, and I was going to talk about that at the end as an example. So yes, there is a pilot project site here that did achieve certification, and it is the Entry Gardens to Man Library. So I, yes, and I have some good, some
some good stats on that too. So um, interesting also to look at what uh, pilot projects, um, how they were able to go through and what level of certification. So at the time of the pilot projects, we had a star system. So the more stars you got, the higher the level of certification. So four stars would be equivalent to platinum. And uh, one star would be equivalent to, I guess, is it uh, bronze or? Yeah, it's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, I think, for lead. So these were the approximate equivalencies. But you can see here that the vast majority of the, of the projects went for the one star certification, which is a little bit easier uh, to do. The hardest, obviously, is the four stars. Um, and I believe that was the Phipps Conservatory um, in Pittsburgh. And so anybody who's gone to the Phipps Conservatory can uh, check out that site. They are tremendous in their leadership in sustainability. And in fact, they were able to get certified triple certification in LEED Platinum for their building, um, Living Building Challenge certification, which is all or nothing, and then uh, the highest level of certification for sustainable sites. So they are really uh, an, exemplary, an exemplary project to look at. So now we've got the site's version two rating system, and then we also have a reference guide. So these are available uh, online. And so within the new rating system, uh, there is a division in, of different guidelines and credits that um, follow in line, uh, basically following the general design process that when you're going through a new project, um, if you've, you've got your landscape architect, your design team, your engineers in place, and your contractors hired, um, it takes it from pre-design um, site and concept um, through to planning different aspects from water management, soil vegetation, uh, your materials usage, um, your your reuse of materials, hopefully, as well. Um, then also guides you through human health and well-being and how to plan for your community or just general usage of the site to optimal effect. Then going into construction and then operations and maintenance guidelines, since we all know that a project doesn't end when the construction is over, we all also have to operate and keep um, our sites working functionally. And so that's an extra challenge even um, beyond what was normally taken into account with the buildings because all of this uh, entails stewarding functional living landscapes. So a building can theoretically um, be a little bit more stagnant than a landscape can, but a landscape is always going to be changing and it's always going to hopefully um, be, be growing in some way as well. So managing that over time is actually much more challenging, I would argue, than than um, opening a building and maintaining a building. Although I manage facilities and horticulture in my current job, so I know too that buildings break down and they're difficult to do as well. So I don't want to um, I don't want to say that it's not easy. It's not hard for both things, but I think managing landscapes and thinking about this long term is even much more difficult for for these kinds of systems. And then beyond that, there's also um, credits and guidelines for how to go forth. Um, with extra, um, extra work that you can do for education and monitoring the performance over time of these landscapes, and then even extra innovation and exemplary performance credits. Since these, these projects have been tremendous in coming back with, to us with all sorts of really innovative things that we had never thought of before. So always looking to steward that. So there's a scorecard that looks kind of similar to what you might find if you run through a lead project. and. This is what it looks like. I'm not, you, you can look at this online. It's a lot of small print. But um, you get the picture. You can kind of do your little checklist um, ahead of time and then through the process and see how you're scoring. So it's also interesting to look at the kinds of professionals who have been reporting to us that they're most interested in this project. And so obviously, you can see that landscape architects um, have been uh, the majority interest in this project. and that's. That's reflective, obviously, of the fact that they're the ones who are really involved with, um, with the, um, I guess, design and construction process in a lot of these projects. But there's a, a lot of other professions that this should also be affecting and um, hopefully stewarding new professional, um, I guess, interest in sustainability. And so I know I'm a horticulturist by training, and I found working through this process to be invaluable. And um, I think because of it, I'm hopefully a better partner in the construction process when I get involved with that. And so I, I think there, there's a lot to be learned for a whole slew of different professions here. So the system's based on a 200 point scale at this point, and it recognizes percentage of attainment. Um, there's actually 18 mm -hmm. prerequisites. So 
those are not just credits, those are uh, things that you absolutely must do um, in order to be a part of the system. And so I'll explain a few of those going forward. But beyond the 18 prerequisites, there's also many points. Um, and then some of the points are awarded for different credits based on level of attainment as well. And so there's now four levels of attainment that are will approximate now the LEED system. So now we're going more into the platinum and the gold um, certification, I believe, in order to make it mesh better with the LEED system. Um, so el eligible projects um, could be uh, new construction, but maybe may may major renovations as well. But this is really a system designed for brand new projects. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really difficult to try to do it after the fact, so I don't recommend it myself. Um, there's no maximum size, but there is a minimum of 2,000 square feet in order to, um, to be involved. And we're open to all projects types with sites, uh, with buildings or without. So that was the other interesting um, comparison to LEED early on. Um, if you didn't have a building on your site, you couldn't get LEED certification. And so you know, what, there's a lot more than just buildings. So we felt it was important that you didn't have to hang your hat on a building in order to be considered a sustainable site. And then this is also open globally as well. So there were some initial pilot projects um, that applied to be a part of the, the testing process, and including my own, which was in Canada, and I think a few in Australia. So I'm not sure if any of those actually finished. I think there was a few extra challenges that comes from trying to um, work on this project from outside the country. But that's something I know they're gonna be working on, and the Green Building Council has the capacity to bring it forward and to a global scale. So the principles behind the process um, involve an examination of your waste hierarchy. And so ultimately, we try to prevent waste. If we can't do that, we reduce it. Then if we can't do that, we just reuse and then recycle. And then the ultimate uh, worst thing that we can do is really to have things that are disposed. So um, we, we try to avoid that. So we try to stay to the top of the waste hierarchy with the system credits. And then we're also trying to instill a paradigm shift from not just conservation, but regeneration. So I'll show some examples of projects that um, were, went beyond just conserving high value landscapes, but also took pretty um, dysfunctional landscapes and then made them into regenerative ones. So this, this graphic shows um, further the, the difference between conservation and then bringing it over to, re to generation. So if you have a, 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 a well-performing landscape, you could, in theory, conserve what you have and just get really good tree protection or protect that site. You know, putting a fence around it is just an example of that. And then you're gonna come out, you know, okay. Just cons conservation is very important. And we're trying to steward that in the process. Um, or you could manage a little bit better what you've got if you're not doing such a good job of that. Restoration, you know, if you cut your tree down, maybe you can try to restore the landscape and then get it back up to a functional level. And then, of course, there's lots of sites that we're working with that are toxic. There's like n hardly any life in them right now. And the existing conditions are deplorable. So um, sites are really encouraged to take on those kinds of challenges in the process and to develop a project that's going to create future site conditions that are, that are much, much better and have uh, regenerative and functional landscapes in the future. So I said I was going to focus a little bit on soil and vegetation credits, since I think that probably best applies to most of this, this group here. And so um, a lot of the credits you can see listed here uh, pertain to that. Uh, there's four at the top that are actually required. And so that's um, what I mentioned before, the prerequisites. So you can see here that you have no, you have no recourse but to create and communicate a soil management plan. We must see that in order for you to be considered a part of the system uh, for sustainable sites. You have to agree to control and manage your invasive species and you have to use appropriate plants. And so it's interesting how we define all this, but uh, we've debated a lot over that, but everybody on the team felt that it was imperative that we at least start with that as a baseline. And so the rest of the credits are actually optional. Um, and so there's different levels of points that you can get depending on um, how you can go through the process. So some examples include controlling and managing invasive plants. As I mentioned, we just thought this was not even an option. And so 
you can see here, I think this is kudzu. So we just don't even want to talk about why anymore. It's like, just do it. Just control and manage and deal with invasive species if you're developing a new site. And don't add new invasive species into your projects either. So that's also something that's very important and that gets vetted through the system. Um, and so I don't know. I think I'd probably be preaching to the choir to even go further into why that's as important. So I think I'll just move on. But you can talk to me afterwards if you want to um, discuss that further. Um, using appropriate plants. This was something that went over a lot of debate, and I know Nina was involved a lot in this discussion too. We, we are trying to steward not native plants necessarily, but just appropriate plants. So as long as they're not invasive and they're appropriate for the site, then that's fine. So you could theoretically get sustainable sites accreditation without having any native plants on your site if you so chose. There are definitely some credits that uh, encourage uh, native plants and responsible use of native plants, but it's not always um, the most appropriate to, to be um, you know, only using native plants. So that's not what this is all about. It's just making sure that they're appropriate and that they're legally uh, sourced as well, since our industry sometimes has some issues with um, illegal sourcing of plant material um, and you know, making sure that the nurseries are also you know, in line with that is really important. Um, using appropriate plants, if you're going for this kind of credit, you might just show a planting plan similar to this, and it's not really all that complicated. You know, this is just an example of one of the submissions for, for a project, and you know, it hopefully isn't going to be too difficult to, to get this credit and just you know, do the checkoff list and make sure you're not doing invasive species and you'll probably be okay. Um, also, there's credits to and prerequisites to conserve healthy resources. And so some of those include um, mapping and making sure that you're on top of uh, your, the creation and management of vegetation and soil protection zones. So um, it's always an uphill battle, it seems, when you're dealing with construction to make sure that you're protecting trees or soil quality that um, that you've got on your site that are existing that are functional. So this is a credit, um, or actually this is a prerequisite, sorry, that designates and communicates your vegetation and soil protection zones at the get-go. So this is, again, not an option. You just have to do this. And so hopefully this should be best management practice or proper practice for any construction project. But anybody who's ever been involved with a project knows that that's not always the obvious thing. And keeping on track with that, it can be really difficult. So I know we still struggle with this at Book of Mechanic Garden. And it's something that I'm always trying to make sure that the specifications we do and with the uh, management of the projects that we're on top of it. But it's so important. So this could be an example of um, you know, communicating where your vegetation and soil protection zones are going to be on a project. Uh, you know, you would say, oh, I've got prime farmland here. I don't want to run that all over with heavy equipment and destroy the soil quality there. I've got existing native plant communities. Let's not destroy those by driving bulldozers all over it or parking our trucks there. Then also uh, special status vegetation. So there's also some credits in the system, um, not just for high quality native plant communities or farmland soils, but for, um, I guess, heritage value specimens. So sometimes trees might not be native, um, and they, but they might have some sort of other value that is important for you to preserve in the site. So trying not to destroy all that during the, the process is really important. There's also an interesting credit that I wanted to mention called optimized biomass. And so that has been um, debated quite a lot. But essentially here, it's um, intended to help you support the water, nutrient, atmospheric, gas, and climate regulation <laughs> systems um, on site by maintaining a sort of ecological in integrity for that site that's comparable to what is in your native plant communities there. So while that might sound a little complicated, what all it comes down to is really determining what the terrestrial biome, so what if you're in a desert community, don't try to plant a landscape that is going to be approximate to what you would have in the Northeast because you're going to need so many more water and nutrient inputs that it's not a very sustainable landscape. So, and likewise, you know, you might not want to try to create a desert landscape and not expect a lot of success with that if you're trying to do that in a really rainy area. You know, just be realistic and look at what's around you and look at the resources that will be coming into your site naturally with precipitation, climate, temperature, soils, 
and 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 just look at that and be realistic about that. And so, um, and by that, then you can sort of what what you're doing there is optimizing your biomass. So similarly, there's another credit for reducing urban heat island effects. So how do we do that, and how do we calculate that? Well. We look at the area of non-roof areas, um, and then you know, pu put in these numbers here. You know, you've got your non-roof measures, your area of high reflectant roofs. So, in the credit, it also takes into account um, vegetated areas. So, you can vegetate your roof and help to mitigate a little bit of urban heat island effect with that. Um, but you can also just um, change the reflectivity of the surfaces um, of your site as well. So, there's options. There's options with that. Um, also, we're, we're looking to use vegetation to minimize building energy usage. So, so this was a really interesting credit that I worked a lot on, where we developed calculations um, to try to prove whether your vegetation on your roof or even around the building was able to provide um, uh, reduced energy benefits to the building itself. So by that, if you have a green roof, um, you're likely going to reduce your air conditioning costs quite significantly. So we've got a calculator to help you with that. Um, similarly, if you plant um, certain shade trees at a very specific distance to your building, then you can also derive benefit from shading around and outside your building uh, that are going to reduce the energy costs for that building themselves. So they're, they're, you know, the heating and the cooling aspects of this are, are very interesting. And depending on what climate zone you are, you might be going more towards the air conditioning uh, reduction through shading, or if you're in a northern community, can you derive uh, benefit from planting, strategic plantings that are going to reduce um, your heating? And so the answer is yes, but you have to really think about that and design that as such. Also, there's a credit which um, developed and is obviously very important depending on the area that you're living in and the landscape that you're developing to strategically plant to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfires. So something that's really important out west. Um, and so we worked with uh, forest, um, forest Service guidelines um, from the west coast. And there was already quite a lot of data on um, strategically planting or not planting things in some cases close to or around um, your sites in order to reduce the risk of complete devastation by wildfires. Also, um, controlling and retaining your construction pollutants. This is something um, similarly to the um, maintaining your vegetation and soil protection zones during the construction process. This is a prerequisite as well. You actually have no choice but to do this, thank goodness, because um, sometimes during your construction process, construction pollutants or other pollutants can, um, can create a lot of havoc. And so erosion is also a big part of this consideration. So you have to prove that you're not creating a worse situation through your construction process through, through this. Um, rainwater management as well. So um, we're also looking to steward uh, different kinds of management of precipitation on the site and improving your runoff volume and water quality in general. And so a lot of sites have really taken this to heart in the pilot projects at least and have gone on to do a lot of great uh, water management strategies. So this is just an, an example. Uh, obviously, these are rain gardens and bioswales and a parking lot to control runoff there. So now I'm going to go into um, some actual pilot project examples um, and show you some of what's come to fruition over the last couple of years through the, the testing and refinement of the process. So this is Hunts Point Landing, which is in the Bronx in New York. And so this is the before. And it's not very pretty. This is even further to the water. So you can see here, it's a highly degraded landscape. Um, and yeah, I guess you know, you've got a couple people who are able to fish there. But in general, this is not very high, a very high quality site. So um, luckily, the, they were able to get a much better design in, implemented here. And has anybody ever been to this site? No? OK. Well, anyway, you can see here that they've installed a whole wonderful landscape here, opened it up. It's become a major public amenity. They still, I think, allow the fishing to continue. So they, they saw that as a positive on the site already, that people were using it as such. So um, it's, it's just a, it's a much nicer uh, area now overall. And um, obviously, a lot of sites in the Bronx 
as you know, um, are highly degraded and would be considered uh, brownfield. So I think this was also um, in that category. So um, extra points are awarded for those who choose to take on a brownfield site and to remediate it and to create a beautiful landscape on those sites because those can be particularly challenging and expensive to, uh, to manage. So these are the points uh, breakdown of what this particular pilot project was able to achieve. So you can see here, because it was a brownfield, they got the maximum amount of points, 21 points for their site selection. Just by selecting the brownfield, they were off to a good start. Then they all also got four, four, uh, four out of four points for pre-design assessment and planning, some pretty good water stewardship points, uh, soil and vegetation, you know, about 50% 50, 50 there, but still pretty good. Material selection, they didn't get anything, so I'm not sure what went on there, but maybe that just wasn't the priority of the project, but it's interesting to see how you could still achieve certification without um, necessarily having to go into all of the credits. Um, human health and well-being, because they kept this uh, to be a, a good public amenity and it was still a public site, they were able to prove uh, value there. Construction process obviously is pretty well managed and they're still monitoring it um, and we're able to also get some innovation points. So, so this is just a good example. Um, and then now here's how it looks today. So another great example uh, is Washington Canal Park. And so this is, uh, was a highly degraded site in the middle of Washington DC. It used to be a bus depot as you can see there. And um, when you take the above view, you can see that it uh, is obviously surrounded in, in, you know, by dense, plant, dense, not planting, dense buildings, and um, that this site um, was going to likely be a challenge to develop as a sustainable site. But they came up with some fantastic solutions to manage this site from here on in with um, all rainwater and stormwater harvested water supplies. So this is uh, a graphic uh, that might be a little far away for you to see in detail, but essentially they're collecting rainwater from all the buildings around this uh, uh, courtyard area and um, directing the stormwater um, underground and cleaning the water so that it's using um, this water in all different ways on the site. So. Here are some examples of their, of their rain gardens and, uh, and then their collection mechanisms here, which are relatively simple, but then they go underground and recirculate. And then they actually even have, so essentially rainwater harvested, open, uh, sort of publicly accessible um, fountains, which if anybody works in, in regulations at all, this is really difficult to get through the regulatory bodies because for many, many years, there's been a big fear of not having traditional um, treated potable water in all your water features for, that are publicly accessible. So this is a fight, they fought the good fight here and they won because they were able to prove that they could take storm water and take rainwater and clean it to the point where they could have it be you know, of a high enough quality to have children playing with it. So that's really tremendous, and um, so kudos to them. This is really a fabulous project, not just for that reason, but that is one amazing thing that they were able to do. So I think, luckily, they were probably able to connect with the uh, U.S. Botanic Garden, which is a site close by that was a major developer of this entire system, and probably get them on board to help get the decision makers to make sure that this was able to happen. So. Um, also, no, I can't forget to mention the Cornell University's Mann Library entrance, which is a pilot project that was completed in 2012. And it was planted, I know, through um, Nina's class. Now, I can't, do who, I can't remember the name of the class. Is it Urban? Yeah, Urban Eden, that's right, okay. So it was planted through uh, and planned through the Urban Eden class. And so they were able to achieve a one star rating. So one star is absolutely better than no stars. So um, fantastic that they were able to do this. And this was also a testing case for a really small site. This site is not that large. It's really essentially the, the planting areas right in front of the landscape, so not the whole quad. And um, they've also been doing tremendous work because they are um, testing the soil over time and they're feeding the data back on some of the soil remediation work that was done in this particular area back into the site's um, sort of data collection process. So 
they, they used a scoop and dump technique to remediate the soil, which had been heavily impacted by construction. So it was basically, um, I think, used in part as a parking lot for some of the construction practices, or maybe a staging area in some, area, in some, in some respects. So all of that can really negatively impact the soil. And so they have a control as well. They have a, an area of comparative, um, I guess, soil quality from the time when they started that they're leaving as a control too. And so they're comparing and contrasting how the soil quality is improving over time. Um, and I believe they're using the healthy uh, Cornell Healthy Soils uh, test protocols for that. Is anybody familiar with that here? Yeah, so that's, that's how they're going through. And so primarily this particular pilot project was a lot about soil quality and, and planting and what, what results um, you can get over time from that, from making adjustments. So I mentioned before that there's 200 points total for certification, so um, they're moving more into the sites certified, so baseline or silver, gold, and platinum, and um, anything over 135 points is considered platinum level or above. And the Green Building Council now taking on the certification um, fully, I, I think it's still actually a little bit in development, so since the announcement of the certification process moving into Green Building Council status um, is still pretty early on. They're still coming together and finalizing that. So um, if you're interested in, in registering a site um, as a sustainable site, you, you should probably contact the sustainable sites people first. And you can actually get registered and you can get on your way with it. And of course, you can always use the guidelines. The guidelines, you don't have to register and certify as a project to use the guidelines. You just kind of have to have the book or download it. So, um, and we always encourage anybody to use them. You don't have to go through full certification. Um, even any small component of this has got a lot of great material in it. So we encourage that. Um, but how it all fits together long term is uh, that GBCI does the credentialing. And so they're actually a separate nonprofit from the U.S. Green Building Council. And they set this up deliberately so that the U.S. Green Building Council's lead system wasn't getting vetted and certified by itself. So they thought in, in order to avoid the conflict, they have a separate body, the GBCI group, that does the actual certifications of the projects. But the U.S. Green Building Council is the one responsible for professional development education and so stewardship of the overall system. And so that's really the way it's going to work, but in partnership with the Sustainable Sites team that works out of um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas, of course. So that's meshing together now and um, is well on its way to full accreditation. What's likely to come in a year or two is professional credentialing. So is there anybody here who is certified as a lead professional? No? Maybe that's generally more landscape architecture um, credential, but you can be professionally certified and credentialed to be a lead professional, and there's various levels of lead professional um, credentialing. So the thought is that you could also be certified as a professional sites, um, on professional sites. And I'm not sure exactly what they're going to call that, but that's likely coming in 2017. So uh, worth mentioning also is Landscape for Life, which um, is a somewhat lighter version of the Sustainable Sites Initiative that's been stewarded through the U.S. Uh, Botanic Garden primarily, and it's really an educational uh, program that uh, it, it helps homeowners and folks who aren't really in the in the landscape profession better understand sustainable sites. Uh, there's a lot of heavy data and information and um, and work in the Sustainable Sites Reference Guide that is far beyond what your average homeowner or somebody who's not going to delve that deeply into it really wants to get into. So sustainable sites is for professionals. This is really for anybody, um, including general decision makers who don't really need to know all the nitty gritty details about it. But it, it gives a lot of the underlying principles that are also in sustainable sites, but takes them to a, a pretty basic level. And so there's a whole education uh, program that U.S. Uh, Botanic Garden works through here. So you can get actually free online training or even in-course training. And there's a little bit of a train the trainer component as well. So this is also a great project for um, folks who are in community horticulture and community horticulture stewardship. So um, it's worth checking out. You can go on their website and download a lot of great materials and connect with them if you're interested. And so with that, I will thank you. And I'd love to open up uh, for any questions. Sonia. 
So the question is, how, what do you do with existing sites that you don't want to fully renovate or completely gut and redo, and how to work on those? Yeah, I think that's a very good thing to think about on the horizon. So my prediction is that similar to the way the LEED system has developed over time, LEED uh, started with new construction, then it moved into other types of systems that go far beyond new construction, including existing buildings, operations, and maintenance, and LEED for neighborhoods, which is at a whole different scale for urban planning, and so on and so forth. So I predict that sites could go in that direction as well, and so we've definitely talked about that, but um, existing sites, um, existing site operations and maintenance is definitely a, a whole different scene. <laughs> so, um, but probably that will come, yeah. It's just gonna take some time. They're gonna have to get through the professional credentialing first and then get make sure that the new, the new, project, um, the new project system is, is well underway before they get. Well, yeah, that's a really good question too. So the follow-up. So I think one thing that we hoped through the development of sites to do is to have follow-up and to not just say, all right, see you later, here's your certification, and then you could let it all go to pot in theory and you would still have your site certification. That's something that we really don't want to happen, but the cost to come back and keep checking on sites over time is actually quite significant. So um, I, w I should mention that there's actually a flat rate pretty much right now to be uh, registered and to be uh, going through the certification process. So regardless of the size of your site at this point, it ranges between about $2,500 to like $9,000 depending on um, how you're going to go through certification. And that's just kind of like a flat fee. And so in order to be able to afford through the management of the system to be sending people back, there may have to be like an add-on after the fact so that you can kind of keep your certification over time. And I think with the landscape side of it, it really makes sense to do that long term and to try to you know just keep checking up on it. The lead system, from what I understand, doesn't really have that. So once you get your lead platinum certification, there there isn't at this point, and they may maybe they're changing this, um, a way to go back and ensure that that particular building that's been certified for new construction is operating optimally or still operating with all the principles in place. So it's an interesting challenge. Well. As I think with all of these semi-competitive um, systems, like the competitive nature in people is one hopeful <laughs> motivation, even though that can sometimes come out as a negative. Um, we want people to compete to be the most sustainable in their landscape design, construction, and maintenance. So I think that's definitely one factor that, like it or not, you know, we, we, we tend to have that as one, one motivation. Um, also, anybody who's gone through the pilot process and looked deeply at the system, I think really finds that they learn a lot too through the process. So um, hopefully that's one motivation and just wanting to get on track uh, for sustainability long term is something that I think is really important to keep in mind as well. Also, I'm coming from a public garden standpoint and a lot of public gardens have figured out that they just need to do this no matter what, that we need to be the leaders. So there's been a lot of great leadership in the public garden world already in, in um, working with sustainable sites. As I mentioned, Phipps Conservatory, U.S. Botanic Garden, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, a lot of public gardens have taken this on and felt that they just have to do this to maintain the, the brand that they have because it's expected that we be really top notch, not only in our landscapes in general and how beautiful they look, but also in all the underlying sustainability um, in the design and management of those systems. So it seems like easy for us, um, whether your typical privately managed landscape or privately owned um, or industrial landscape wants to go to this. I think it, it may be something about you know brand management that they want to push forward also. And I know that's, I think, what stewarded a lot of it with LEED. Um, early stage um, and high-ranking lead projects as well. Well, so the interesting thing is some of these sections, you actually can't ever get all of them because it's almost like an either-or. So either you're doing, if you don't have um, certain site conditions, you just can't do it. And so it's not that you should be penalized for not doing it. And so that's the challenge with the scoring system. You might always feel that if you don't get everything that you're not doing the best. 
But if, say, you don't have a natural area, you can't get a credit for protecting natural areas because you just don't have one. Or if you don't have a wetland on site already, you can't get a credit for protecting an existing wetland. So there's several credits like that that are really optional, and so it's not designed that you can get all of them. So, so that's partially the problem. Or it's not really a problem. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, in, in the town just east of here, we have zoning that incentivizes lead, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see this added to that. Uh, the problem that we've run into is that because it's a qualitative, you know, the assignment of points is somewhat qualitative, we find we have proposals that are offering very different ecosystem service mm -hmm. levels, but they both qualify uh, for getting the incentive. So. Uh, that is a constant problem, trying to, to make sure the rating system matches the benefit that they're actually bringing yeah. to, the, to a project. Oh, it's, it's very, very big and deep and wide challenge. <laughs> I don't know any other way to say that. It's, there's a lot to think about here, and trying to steward a holistic system and to think about all the different parameters and all the different ways that we could be quantifying and calculating properly is really, it's really challenging, but it's a lot of fun. Thank goodness, like, it is fun too, I should have mentioned that. That's kind of my motivation. It's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm going to, you know, hurt my brain a lot doing this, but it's, but it's for the best, hopefully. Melanie, thank you so much. Oh, thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.